Well, I, I thought, um, uh, given this is a, a limited talk, uh, I, I'd rather do something more formal this time than my ad lib lecture. So, um, and I have it timed for the 15 minutes. I hope I don't go over. But please give me a, a little leadway if I do. Um, I, I want to uh, talk about the notion of dialectics and recognition. Because uh, I think this is very, this is something that applies, I think, to all of our uh, work and all of our theoretical orientations, regardless of differences. Now, all ter although the term dialectic has a rich philosophical history, its use and application in psychoanalysis is murky at best. The term is thrown around in contemporary writings seemingly without definition, let alone precision, to the point that it loses its technical meaning. Dialectics may refer to a way of conceiving of identity and difference, negation and antithesis, tension and harmony, or as an interplay of opposites that mutually engage one another in, in symmetrical or asymmetrical relations. It's through Hegel's logic that dialectics shows its sophistication, and we can readily see how dialectical methodology has applied value for psychoanalytic inquiry. But I also argue for any type of, of theoretical work uh, that applies to, uh, to therapy. In adopting a dialectical approach to psychology, I coined the term dialectical psychoanalysis or process psychology, and I went on to offer a formal systematic psychoanalytic metaphysics based on neo-Freudian and neo-Hegelian principles in a couple books, hence attempting to account for an unconscious ontology that structures, saturates, and conditions individual consciousness, inner subjectivity, and collective society alike. In other words, the dialectic is the foundation of psychic life. If it were to disappear, psyche and society would vanish. Now let me explain. The nature of mind and social reality is comprised of a series of op opposing forces that are in conflict with one another, yet are dialectically constituted, mutually implicative, and undergo relational exchange as a process-oriented system. Identity is always defined in opposition to difference. Yet identity and difference must ontically relate, uh, necessarily so, or we would have no separation between the two perspectives. They would remain identical without difference. But that is not how we experience reality. We always experience ourself in relation to otherness, internality and externality, the individual and the collective as an inner outer spectrum or divide. It is here that we are constantly having to mediate our unique self-experience from our encounters with others and other objects in our environs and the greater systemic processes that define our concrete lives and social realities. Dialectics are everywhere and happening all the time, yet they remain largely operative on unconscious levels. As tensions and conflicts emerge in our confrontation with difference and otherness, we are forced to acknowledge and mediate such differences in order to attempt to comprehend accommodate and reconcile our variances in some manner. Whether this lies in acknowledging the otherness of patient and therapist, the one and the many, individual and group identity, differences in race, ethnicity, language, culture, and so on, psyche and society are interdependently conjoined in dialectical relations. Here, psyche becomes a cacophony of competing internal dramas based on an interplay and dialogue of opposites. When cognition dialectically encounters an object of experience, Hegel shows uh, how it must mediate the object of thought as an opposition or a contradiction to itself. In doing so, 
Opposition must overcome or must be overcome by apprehending and subsuming the otherness within our own interiority that at once is annulled but preserved, integrated, and elevated at the same time. Hegel understands this process as a developmental progression capable of achieving greater forms of complexity in and self-awareness of its own nature as Geist or spirit or mind uh, or what we may call the psyche. This process of the dialectic underlies all operations of mind and is seen as the thrust behind world history and culture. Now what is important for process psychology, however, is understanding the essential structure of the dialectic as sublation or Aufheben, denoted by these three simultaneous movements. At once they cancel or annul each other, they transcend or surpass, and they also retain or preserve aspects of every transmutation. Not only does the psyche destroy opposition, but it subsumes it and preserves it within its interior. As each valence is highlighted in its immediacy or lived experiential quality, it is merely one appearance among many appearances in the overall process of its own becoming. Now, in offering amendments to Hegel's dialectic, I have argued that mind also has a dual tendency to fixate on earlier developmental experiences or dialectically regress or withdrawal back to previous states of disposition or comportment and become mired in, let's say, neurosis, psychopathology, and trauma, it cannot transcend in its natural progressive drive toward individuation or wholeness. This ensures that the presence of negativity will play a central feature in the dialectic and will come to condition the personal lives of all people and the social structures we participate in our being in the world or what I've come to call our psi world. What this means is that self and society must necessarily face the role of the negative in all its manifestations, in our attachments and relatedness to others, psychosocial development, communal affairs, social political institutions, and in our traumatic relations to life, from the cradle to the grave. Now working dialectically, in the consulting room, I work as a dialectician, confronting and juxtaposing opposition to the patient's immediate subjective reality with the aim of directing the client toward a meaningful understanding and integration of competing antithetical processes. I do not know what the end process will assimilate nor entail, nor do I pretend to know what it, what it should be like for each individual. Only the process born of the lived inner subjective encounter will dictate the teleological progression of the therapy. And my responsiveness and my presence is as much contingent upon the contexts of that process as is the pa patient's unique subjectivity or personality traits, their unconscious dynamics and life history. Therefore, nothing's the same. Uh, the, the clinical utility of the dialectic, though, becomes apparent in the consulting room when patients present with countless advertative neg negating and competing wishes or desires uh, and or intentions that stand in sharp contrast to their respective opposites, namely their counter wishes, fantasies, and defenses that oppose certain tendencies in the mind that come under attack by the rigid antipode that is established in the patient's psyche as intercontradiction. Uh, I'm sorry, I meant to say inner contradiction, but I suppose it's also intercontradiction. In in terms of technique, um, I hate that word technique, but if I had, I'm trying to do my best to explain this to you. 
Um, working, working dialectically involves highlighting a specific piece of subjective reality in the patient within the immediacy of the therapeutic moment and exploring it, whether it be conceptually, imagistically, affectively, symbolically, defensively, transferentially, you name it. Um, and this is in relation to that which is not consciously spoken of or acknowledged as such. Each psychic event contains its opposite. So this is an assumption of mine. The opposite, therefore, being and nothing, identity and difference, are mutually implicative. They're there, but only one appearance is, is happening at the time. Following the logic of the dialectic, there is presumed to be the opposite of what the patient articulates or discloses contained within the very nature of such disclosure itself, albeit in cryptic or disguised forms, uh, ever present but hidden. It becomes the task of the therapist to listen uh, for the, the hidden narrative, ferret out the opposition, and bring it into dialogue with the particular piece of subjectivity that's currently overshadowing the patient's attention or dominating one's life narrative. Splitting, opposition, and impasse set up conflict and tension in the mind and, and, and the lived experiential reality. Each uh, process, self-state, or mode of subjectivity is radically misaligned when juxtaposed to others based on the simple quality of difference, each side of difference valuing competing loyalties. And this can apply to specific mental content, affect, impulses, defenses, fantasies, or self-states that form certain allegiances that combat other self-states or competing parts of psychic organization. This inevitably trickles into the interpersonal medium of therapy, thus acquiring new forms of opposition and conflict that extend and magnify specific dialectical tensions that are intrapsychically realized by each subject, both the patient and, and the therapist. In, in Freud and Jung's early pivotal work, we may readily observe the dialectical tensions that populate the mind and fuel symptom substitution as failed compromise formations. Symptom formation is failed compromise by virtue of the fact that symptoms do not offer a sublated form of dialectical progression or unification. Yet they are dialectical manifestations of opposing wishes, conflicts, and complexes that have transmogrified into maladaptive forms. What becomes important in working dialectically with patients is to uncover opposition within the presentational immediacy of experience and attempt to bring those opposing forces to bear on one another in an effort to find some resolution through, let's say, negotiation, compromise, and some kind of integration into a more comprehensive unity within the patient's dynamic organizing principles. Thus, the integration of, of the complex, split-off, compartmentalized, and segregated systems of mental operations and defenses into a more meaningful whole becomes a central element of therapy. And this ultimately requires the enlistment of insight and reason for a full comprehension of the competing and conflictual processes under question. This is why therapy is a liberation struggle, to transcend that which is unknown and, and operative within us via actualizing higher levels of self-conscious realization in thought and action. There is opposition contained in every psychic experience, and, and often this undisclosed, unspoken antithesis is an unconscious dynamic that informs the patient's immediate experience. Here we may observe, let's say, a universal dictum. Every fear, to go to Jonathan, is also a wish. 
Every fear contains its counterpart within its dialectical structure because each fear may only be experienced and defined in relation to what it is not. Therefore, it's, it's not uncommon when a patient fears the occurrence of a particular event, let's say the fear that her mother will be in a car accident, uh, we may also su suspect a particular death wish directed toward her mother that's fueling the anxiety that signals the ego to be fearful to begin with. Uh, anxiety associated with her reintrojected hatred for her mother that she's unconsciously harbored, but of course consciously disavowed. That which troubles the patient is largely because it stands in opposition to another competing aspect of the patient's psyche that needs to be clarified and given a particular voice. Okay, <laughs> I guess I'm not going to make it. <laughs> um, let me, just, let me just finish this last piece. The uh, uh, collocation of these dualistic ambitendent desires creates distress when they are confronted and forced to face one another directly, hence bringing about a dialectical confrontation that must be mediated in the intersubjective therapeutic process. This is so by the simple fact that every conscious thought and intention has its opposite contained, albeit concealed, within the very premise or proposition of the patient's stated experience, which stands in competition with other dynamic aspects of the psyche that clamor for release and expression. Just one question, John. Uh, don't you think that the CBT and the psychodynamic also have uh, this dialectical relations when they negate each other? And, and can, can you say something about that? Well, I, I would imagine that we're all up, we are all working in different ways, but getting at the same thing. Maybe just on different levels of parallel process, but if we extend it to the the diatribes that take place professionally between, let's say, psychoanalytic and, and um, CBT or integrative people, it's there too. It's got to be. Thank you.